Hey everyone, it's Juan Wezar with Sage Real Estate. I'm super excited. Uh, we're in the CoStar offices, downtown Los Angeles, sitting down with Rafael DeAnda. Rafael is one of the um, head analysts here with CoStar. He's tracking data when it comes to retail here in the Los Angeles sector. Rafael, tell us a little bit about yourself, how long you've been with CoStar, and let's dive into what we're gonna be covering today. Absolutely. So I am an associate director here of Market Analytics. My background is actually in economic consulting. So historically, uh, one of my you know, hobbies has been to follow what's going on in the economy. When I joined CoStar about six years ago, it really gave me the opportunity to see how that translates to the commercial real estate sector. So I primarily focus on the retail uh, sector within Los Angeles, you know, one of the sectors that's most tied to what's going on in the local economy. Sure, sure. And so today's report is going to be um, a quarter two of 2023, yeah. and we're going to be talking retail. But yeah. kind of walk us through, like, how is it, like, what, what part of retail are we covering and, and kind of how is it that CoStar gets this all together. Sure, so we collect information on all retail properties uh, really across uh, across the nation. So we try to include every property that's out there, the entire universe of properties. We'll focus on Los Angeles County uh, retail properties. Uh, and really, as I mentioned, one of the main drivers of the Los Angeles retail market is going to be consumer spending and population growth. Perfect, yeah. well, let's dive into it. Sure, so before uh, we really begin talking about the commercial real estate sector, let's talk about the demand drivers, right? For the Los Angeles retail market, uh, some of the demand drivers are much like the multifamily sector, right? You have population growth and then you have income growth. How much are these people making? How much can they pay in rent? That's going to translate exactly to the retail sector is how much can they buy in goods and services. But that's actually a structural headwind for the Los Angeles retail market when you consider that we've had population losses since about 2017. Okay. So as people are moving out to some of these lower cost states, for the long term uh, demand of retail properties in, in Los Angeles, it's going to be slightly diminishing. Uh, and so that's something that's going to affect our market structurally going forward. But we can talk about the structural uh, dynamics you know, all day. But what really matters to a lot of investors, it's the cyclical terms. It's what's going to happen in the next few years, Correct. right? The economy grows, uh, it spans at different paces. We want to have a, a stronger economy. So we're often following what's going on cyclically. Now, one key driver for retail demand is retail sales. Now, this is uh, a national figure that we're looking at, uh, a survey that um, surveys all retailers across the nation to get uh, an assessment of how much is being sold every month. This includes uh, retail stores and food service stores, mm -hmm. a perfect proxy for the retail market as a whole. And we actually had a surprise this past month where uh, a lot of economists are calling for consumption levels to slow down and retail sales actually bumped up in July. Uh, pretty strong figure, uh, we're still, retail sales are still growing at about 3% year over year. Now. When you look at the most recent periods, though, we're starting to see things return to, uh, or you're starting to see one trend return that we saw prior to the pandemic, which is that more shopping is being done online, okay. right? So the share of uh, retails and food service sales that is done at non-store retailers is now up uh, to about 17%, sort of on the pace that it was growing at. Uh, prior to the pandemic. Now, this is a trend that we've, I mean, we're looking at the graph. This is a trend that's been happening since 2008. I mean, for the longest time, we've been mm -hmm. hearing, hey, no more brick and mortar shops. And, and there's a fear that there's going to, that they're always going to be eliminated. But I think what we're going to get today, that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, including myself, I'm going to order stuff on, you know, yes. stuff online. It gets delivered. I don't have to go to the shop. It makes a lot of sense in most cases. Yes. And so, I, I guess to see this trend continue to me is not that shocking yep. as, as it's been happening for over a decade. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. And actually when you look at you know, this uh, chart here where you see the proportion of sales that are going to non-store retailers, it does not at all show, uh, you know, the, it doesn't replicate to, the, to a loss of demand nationally in retail because we still do need you know, that retail footprint. A lot of us like to, feel things and see things physically. Uh, we may do some of our shopping online, but a lot of times we still want to see that physically. And some of the retailers who have been able to have the 
um, you know, that multi-channel, um, you know, buy online, see it in person, presence. Some of those have been some of the retailers that have been, uh, you know, the most successful over the years. Sure. Um, now, in terms of, of uh, other categories where we're seeing spending growth, uh, you can kind of see that food services and drinking establishments uh, are seeing the, mo the most growth in retail sales. That's also, again, something that we've been seeing, uh, you know, part of the structural change in the retail sector. We've seen lots of space over the years that used to sell physical goods and now they're selling, you know, food services, their, their restaurants, uh, you know, dining establishments. Healthcare has been a, a, has become a, m a much larger tenant of properties that we have traditionally considered, you know, retail. Now, for the Los Angeles market, as I mentioned, because we've had some slight population losses, our vacancy rate has risen since about 2017 at about a similar rate. Our vacancy rate is now at about 5.4%, the highest that we've seen in, in many years. Much of that is coming because of a loss in demand, meaning that more space is becoming vacant than is becoming occupied at this moment. Um, again, this is something that we're, we're seeing this for the LA market. And again, this is all retail properties. There are definitely winners and losers within the retail sector uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, but when you add it up as a whole, that structural um, challenge for the market is overweighing. Uh, and, and that's why you're seeing the vacancy rate rise slightly. Would you be able to tell us, you know, when we're talking about winners and losers and we're talking about this is this is incorporating all retail. And so yep. when we say all, we're talking new super centers and we're talking um, retail street centers with no parking. Yes. And I know that uh, CoStar does, you know, you guys do the one star, meaning the best and maybe mm -hmm. four or five is the older buildings. Yep. Would you be able to tell us, like, who are the winners and and losers. I mean, is that is that something? Would you say, hey, the winners are the or the newer buildings, or or is it that the winners are maybe the lower priced properties? Yep, I would say that some of the four and five star properties have been performing the best, right? Okay. Because, you know, when you think about any um, slowing in spending or any, you know, uh, restrictions in shopping, we're st we still want that experience. And so when you think about that experiential retail, the shopping centers that bring you in and keep you there for a while, you're more likely to spend there. And some of those shopping centers have been performing better. Um, but, you know, when you think back at where we were about a year ago, uh, where we were spending a lot more of our time near our homes, not necessarily uh, in our office as often, mm -hmm a lot of demand actually shifted towards neighborhood centers and towards suburban areas where we tend to live. I mean, instead of going, you know, to a downtown or to, you know, a, 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 you know, one of the nicer areas that attracts a lot of tourism, we were, you know, dining near our homes and we wanted, you know, we wanted to be close. We wanted to go out for lunch and then return home and, and do our work. So we saw a lot more demand for that neighborhood, for the neighborhood centers. We are starting to see that slightly reverse uh, in this in this past two quarters, mm -hmm. so that's one thing to keep in mind um, when we're kind of talking about winners and losers. That it's not just overall winner and loser uh, over time. It's it, part of it is also what's uh, related to what's going on in the economy. And and it's going to fluctuate. It's going to fluctuate. Sometimes you're a winner, and then the next quarter you might be a loser. So it just depends exactly. on where you're at. Okay. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now uh, another way I like to track uh, what's going on in the retail market is by looking at which types of tenants are leasing space. Now, I know these charts have lots of information here, so I'm going to take a second to walk you through what we're seeing here. On the left side is we're looking at leasing volume measured in square feet by the type of uh, business. So something like furniture, these are stores that sell furniture goods. Those are typically in blue. Uh, services are the pop, pieces of the pie that are in orange. So something like a food service, that's your restaurants, fitness centers have been uh, you know, leasing much more space now. And we can compare that to what we've seen since the start of 2021. And really there's four sectors that I think stand out because of how much larger of a proportion they have in leasing uh, relative to pre-pandemic periods. So first we have home improvement stores. We've seen them pretty active in different shapes and sizes as well. Uh, second, we have discounter stores. 
Third, uh, education and healthcare. Again, I mentioned that a lot of traditional retail properties that we've had are being leased by, um, by education and healthcare services. Uh, and then fitness. And I, I would say that fitness has been sort of one of the biggest uh, demand drivers, you know, especially in, in larger spaces, but not necessarily over 30,000 square feet. They're also active in, in some smaller spaces and sort of more of a boutique format. And so we're seeing that uh, a bit more recently. You know what I make out of this is, is well, two things. One, if, if I'm an investor and if I'm looking to get into retail and, and why would I look to get into retail? Well, I see a couple of things. If I see that the, um, that, that the rents are possibly dropping, well, that, that could maybe make it be a good uh, investment for me if I could negotiate properly. But also if I'm looking at a commercial property to buy and maybe it has a fitness center or maybe it has a home improvement or a discounter store. Well, this data is telling me that those are the ones that are continuing to operate and open up more and more locations telling me that they're just doing better overall when compared to everything else. Yes. Two, if I'm a landlord, if I'm sitting on a property and I have an upcoming vacancy, this is where I'm going to look. And these four categories, this is a great um, illustration of the industries that continue to grow because not all of them, again, not everyone is in a growth mode, but I would say these four is a um, really good illustration of where you should be looking at. Yep. Now let's give you some examples. Uh, you know, on the home improvement side, uh, Ace Hardware was pretty active early in the quarter. Uh, they leased a couple spaces here. There's one in Porter Ranch and another one in Glendale. And different size formats too, right? Where uh, typically you, think, you may think of home improvement as a big Lowe's or Home Depot. Well, no, Ace is leasing spaces, uh, you know, that, are, that range from 15,000 square feet to 47,000 square feet. Uh, on the discounter side, we have a uh, Dollar Tree who leased uh, space in Alhambra. Uh, you know, this is a pretty interesting lease because they actually have another location in Alhambra just a couple miles away. Um, uh, for healthcare, uh, again, this uh, healthcare has typically been leasing spaces in the five to fifteen thousand square feet. Although there there are some examples of larger leases that they've taken mm -hmm. more on the periphery of LA County, like in the Lancaster Palmdale area. Uh, but what you see here, uh, the one that stands out to me is this comprehensive community health centers out in Long Beach. Yep. It's a ten thousand square foot lease, uh, but here they're taking uh, you know they're taking over a space that used to be a restaurant. Um, and while food services is you know continuing to be a pretty strong demand driver. As I mentioned, longer term, uh, food services is, is something that's been taking over a lot of space that has typically sold uh, physical goods. Uh, in this case, there's one, uh, a pretty uh, sizable lease for, um, for uh, healthcare. Mm -hmm. Now, in uh, fitness centers, we've seen a couple uh, major moves. Um, we have a Fitness 19 in Rolling Hills Estates. Fitness 19 is typically marketed as a more of a affordable option. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty interesting to see them uh, take a space in that location. Sure. Uh, Crunch Fitness out in Monrovia. Now this one's pretty interesting because this is a large power center that sort of was, uh, you know, when you look at the tenant base they had just a few years ago, it was going to be in trouble. It had Bed Bath & Beyond, Toys R Us left large space, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck E. Cheese left large space. I mean, this power center, you can kind of just see turning dark for a while. And instead, just with strong demographics in that area, it was able to attract a few other tenants at Burlington move in nearby. And then now Crunch Fitness is uh, scheduled to open later in the year. A few more uh, from fitness centers, as I mentioned, they've been extremely active recently. Out in Long Beach, um, there's a Planet Fitness opening up at a former Gold's Gym. Now, this is uh, one of the sort of oldest Gold's Gyms that I'm aware of, or a former Gold's Gym. It was there forever, right on Pine Street. Yep. Um, they're uh, relocating to the Pike, but as that space is being uh, uh, renovated for them, Planet Fitness came in and take, took their space. So Gold's Gym actually opened a, a temporary location just a few blocks away. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of leasing activity from, from this type of tenant that we're seeing in the market. Now, there are a few notable leases that I think are market movers. We don't quite have a tenant yet, yet, so it's kind of hard to dissect the, you know, and analyze what they mean for the market. But this is really showing that there are uh, 
you know, that there is activity in some, you know, pretty large and prestigious places. So in Almani, there's a 125,000 square foot lease for former Sears that was uh, closed for, for a few years. I'm very curious to see what will happen here. In Pasadena, near Old Town, it's a former Forever 21 where there was a 38,000 square foot lease. Uh, and then out in Sherman Oaks, a former TJ Maxx, uh, you know, this is a prime part of, of Sherman Oaks. 25,000 square feet that least, uh, and so we should have some pretty uh, large store openings there going mm -hmm. forward. Now, the construction market in Los Angeles, I think, is pretty interesting. Uh, we haven't had a lot of construction, uh, of retail construction, uh, for, you know, over a decade. And it really makes sense when you think about the, you know, what I mentioned with population losses, uh, we don't necessarily need a significant amount of more retail. Lots of retail is being renovated, um, and so, you know, often we do see demand for, you know, the new, uh, you know, nice looking built properties, but we don't necessarily need to build new ones, and I think uh, developers have been doing a good job there. We are seeing a little bit of a shift in the market, where one to two years ago, we had some major, you know, construction projects in some key areas, uh, such as, uh, you know, some retail development near SoFi Stadium, uh, here also in uh, the downtown area near some multifamily apartments. Now a lot more, uh, a, lot, a larger proportion of construction is meant to serve uh, your local neighborhoods. We have uh, lots of uh, auto dealerships that are under construction right now. Construction starts have slowed, and so we expect uh, you know supply to just be a very minimal factor when you're thinking about the outlook for the sector going forward. So I'll mention it for, uh, one of the largest projects underway because this, is, I think, is going to impact that market. Mm -hmm. It's the Carson Outlets. It's a 400,000 square foot project that's underway right now. Has seen some delays and it's not expected to complete until the end of December 2024. Now this site was uh, at one point considered for a, for a football stadium. And then as I mentioned, auto dealerships, and we have several of these. This one's expected to open soon. It's in downtown Los Angeles, measuring 227,000 square feet. Now this one's interesting because there are plans to have some multifamily development adjacent to this, mm -hmm. um, to this project. Now, uh, one way we like to track, um, you know, the outlook for the market is we like to look at leasing activity. Now, typically, we were looking at net absorption, which is the space that has become uh, occupied, net of what has become vacant. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of looking at, at what's going on. But that tells you, you know, that gives you the current snapshot of the market. Leasing volume often reflects leases for tenants that are going to move in in the future. And that helps us gauge how much demand there will be going forward, or at least serves as a proxy. And as you can see, leasing activity has been pretty steady. Um, and so when you factor that into our forecast, you're going to see a little bit of softening because it's not quite keeping up with, um, with what's going on in the market. Mm -hmm. But I would say when you compare that to some of the other markets where there has been more construction, uh, where it's dependent on population growth that may not necessarily be there if things start to slow down, the LA market is actually a pretty mature market that tends to behave pretty steady even in down cycles. Now, what we're looking at here is the amount of available retail space. And you can see that when you look at the last, you know, more than 10 years, we've been at about 25 million square feet. So while the vacancy rate has risen slightly, we want to put that in perspective. You know, this is a large market, but the amount of space that's available tends to stay pretty steady. And even when you look at, you know, how that has changed quarter over quarter, there hasn't been much change. Typically, we're in, you know, within the 1 million square foot range where the amount of available space either expands or contracts by 1 million square feet. When you look at these past three quarters, that's, that's about where we've been. Okay. Yeah. And so here's our forecast. As I mentioned, not a lot of risk there on the supply side. Demand is holding up. We may see vacancies rise slightly more and, and sort of uh, reach 5.7%. That's based on our forecast, which we, uh, where we input a mild recession. Uh, that's something that we, um, that we get from Oxford Economics, who's our uh, provider of economic data. Uh, so if you are a little bit more optimistic and there's a lot of signs showing that the consumer continues to spend and that we could avoid a recession altogether, then you can adjust your forecast from there. Um, so that's one way of looking at it.
on, on this slide, um, what I'm seeing is vacancy is going to go up and it's going to remain up. Yes. Right. So which is quite different from, you know, typically we see, you know, obviously vacancy go up and then at some point it starts trickling back down. But that's not really in our forecast. And so we're going to be up in the slightly above five and a half and we're kind of going to be remaining there. So I think I think for a lot of folks watching this, if it may not be as promising mm -hmm. or if you're optimistic, maybe this could be a good chance for a good opportunity. That's because again, there are industries leasing, and that's that's where I would that's my advice is that if we're looking at commercial real estate, um, no going into it like our, our underwriting. Hey, yes, expect higher vacancies yeah. and underwrite with a higher vacancy going in, yeah. but also know what are the industries leasing, yeah. and then and then try to attract that tenant. Exactly, that's a good point. Yep. Now, in our rent forecast, it does call for rent growth to decelerate. Rent growth has been pretty moderate in the LA market. And this is one metric where when you look across the nation and you look at rent growth um, and how that compares to population growth, you can see that there's a very high correlation. Okay. Los Angeles tends to be lower on that list compared to some of the other markets, but that's because we're not having that, um, that type of population growth. But you know that again, that's one of those things that when you look at the market as a whole, that's sort of the baseline. Uh, there are you know, more opportunities and some types of properties that will do outperform. Well, you know, conversely, there are some properties that may not perform as well. Now, I'll talk briefly about capital markets. We did see a contraction in sales volume in the second quarter. Uh, this resembles more of what we're seeing nationally, right, where the impact of higher interest rates is starting to weigh on investors. One thing to keep in mind with transaction activity for LA is that we had a flurry of activity in the first quarter, okay. especially when you compare that to national. And a big reason for that was the ULA transfer tax increase. We think a lot of investors wanted to get ahead of that tax uh, or paying that tax. And so if you had a deal in the works, it just kind of motivated both the buyer and the seller to try to work something out before that deadline. And so there are a few examples of properties where uh, traded right before um, the close. And I think here's one, this is the promenade at Howard Hughes Center. Now, when you look at this property on a map, you might think it's in Culver City, but because of the way the city of LA's boundaries are shaped, this just happens to lie within the city of El Valle. Uh, it was sold for $80 million. Uh, the buyer was Canon Commercial, who acquired it at an 8% cap rate. The seller, Torchlight Investment, um, they acquired it as part of a JV partnership originally in 2015 for $111 million or at a 5.75% cap rate. What do we make? So for, for someone who's looking at this, you know, someone's going to say, man, someone lost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, do we know anything about what um, the prior owner's goals were or where it was that maybe the, um, the deal went sideways on them? Do we, do we have any background on what that may have been the case? Just to yeah. give this a little more than, because yeah. this might show someone like, man, the market's really softening. <laughs> yeah. But this is, this is uh, I would say this is probably not representative of most sales in Los Angeles. This is one specific case and a very yes, massive um, asset for this area. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't quite know the motivation on this one, but I know that when you look at the majority of transactions, you see long term appreciation, right? Correct. They may not be these, you know, multi million, hundred million dollar sales or even over twenty million, but there's a lot of properties in LA that sell for, you know, under five million dollars that have been owned for long periods and have had long-term appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, that's one reason why when we look at our, our market price series. Yeah, we'll skip this one. Mm -hmm. When we look at our market price series, it's showing that prices are still growing. I think part of that might be slightly lagged, and part of that is because our market rent series is a same store series, or it's a, I should say, a repeat sale series. So we look at those properties that have traded over long periods. We factor in that appreciation into our model, mm -hmm. and while the more recent trend might be for values to be softening slightly, we're not seeing that in our market price series. Again, because of so many properties that sell at, at so, a long-term gain. So for, for the folks watching this, you know, we, we've covered a lot of slides and, and we've kind of shown that the rents are actually gonna go down. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
But but what we're seeing here that although rents are going to go down, we, you guys, uh, CoStar believes that the prices for for uh, for these assets are actually going to increase. Is that that's what we're seeing with this slide? Oh, well, th this is the this is more of, of the history slide. Um, so it's showing that the price hasn't. Uh, hasn't significantly fallen Got or it. hasn't, you know, we're not seeing a widespread decline in prices just okay. yet Understand. across properties. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, that said, because of what we are forecasting or, or what our model is driving, we do see uh, some prices, uh, we do see uh, some losses in prices over the next year or two. Again, this is under the scenario where there is a mild recession mm -hmm. and, and there is a pullback in consumer spending. Uh, but longer term, we see that market price returning uh, after a few years. Perfect. So what, what this is highlighting and, and what we've covered in many videos before is it's, listen, most, most cases we see rents rise, values rise. Okay, the, the, those two things go together. But on, on the flip side, mm -hmm. if rents go down, well, then values are going to go down. And that's kind of what we're seeing uh, in Los Angeles when it comes to retail commercial space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So that wraps up. Um, that wraps up sort of the overview of what we're seeing in the market. Happy to, you know, have an, answer any questions you may have. Um, I don't have any questions. I do want to thank you, Rafael, for sitting down with us. Mm -hmm. uh, for anyone out there who is new to CoStar, check it out sign up. It's well worth the, uh, the, the investment because, again, they are the leading source in the world for this type of data because any broker out there, any appraiser is coming here to receive this data because they're out there uh, tracking every single sale and every single lease. And I know they do because when I do a sale or a lease, they're calling me. So they're calling every single broker and they're saying, what happened? Who was the buyer? Who was the seller? Who's the tenant? What's the price? Mm -hmm and they bring this all data down to us. So again, check out CoStar. They're number one in what they do. Thank you so much for today. No, thank you. So there you have it, our interview with Rafael DeAnda with CoStar, one of their head analysts. And so what were our, what was my takeaways? Now, a, a lot of that was, hey, the market is softening, which is just another word for it's slowing down, okay? the talk about recessions coming. And so what is that going to play? So there was a couple things that I, that I thought a lot of folks reach out to us and, and yeah, we do a lot of multifamily, but we do a lot of commercial, we do a lot of mixed use. And so we, we sell um, commercial buildings and, and retail centers. And so there's a couple things. Uh, they've been ta uh, um, talking about population decline. And so when population, when there's a decline in population, and we're not saying it's a huge decline, but in LA, there's so much of a decline, there seems to be less demand for need for retail space. Okay, so that is not exactly the best thing uh, for retail. And a couple other things, they're expecting that rents, rents for that retail space, um, although it was going up, I think it's gonna plateau. And according to their forecast, they expect rents to come down to kind of coincide with the recession that they believe is gonna happen. Now, the recession has been talked about for several years now, or for, for clearly over a year, and it keeps getting postponed. Now, from, from a sales perspective, if you're an investor and maybe you like commercial, maybe you don't like multifamily. I mean, listen, multifamily has all these statewide rent control laws attached to it, and you don't have any of that with commercial. So a lot of the commercial owners that, that we represent as clients, they love what they do. There seems to be a little bit less stress. Now, values there are also coming down. Now, we know that when rents go down, prices go down with it. So um, with, with vacancies being up at 5.7% or 5.5%, that's a little scary, but that's not too bad. I think when we compare that to the national average, it's actually really, really good. And so what do I make of all this? If you're an investor and you're looking to buy more commercial or get started in commercial, I think that it's a buyer's market. It's an investor's market. That means you are the one that gets to dictate where the deal gets done or you don't buy it. And so I do see more uh, commercial property sitting on the market from a sales perspective longer and longer. You know, we don't do a lot of leasing at Sage Real Estate, but we certainly do the sales. And so what do I see? I see price reductions. I see property sitting on the market longer. And all that does is create an opportunity for you the investor to take advantage of that. So if you have any questions about commercial or if there's any other type of niche that you want us to cover, um, make sure you check out CoStar. I appreciate all that they've done for us um, with these past two interviews. And so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time.